I'm Mark Stewart from Hometowns and Heroes, and today we're at Skyline Regional Park here in Buckeye, Arizona, one of the fastest growing communities in the West. And this is the perfect place to introduce to you some of the hometown heroes that have been featured on Direct TV, giving more of themselves, making this a better country. And to start off the show, let's meet Rebecca Blackwell. We're all familiar with the PGA, Professional Golf Association, but did you know that it was started in 1916 by Rodman Wanamaker, the owner of what became Macy's, calling a group of golfers to a meeting. In attendance was Walter Hagen. From that meeting, it was agreed by the group that the organization would be formed to promote the game of golf. Meanwhile, in 1934, Famed all-around female athlete, Babe Didrikson, began playing competitive golf. She became the first woman to enter and compete in a PGA Tour event. Later in 1938, the Babe married George Zaharias. He was a wrestler, and he became her manager throughout the balance of her career. Babe Zaharias dominated women's golf through the late 1940s, but she wanted to add more women's tour events, so she gathered 12 other women golfers together, and in 1950, they formed the LPGA, 34 years after the men's. And that is where our hometown hero, Marilyn Smith, comes in. What a special day this is. We are going to introduce you, if you don't know her personally, <laughs> Marilyn Smith, award-winning golfing legend. She also is one of the 13 founders of the LPGA and is also in the World Golf Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank so you. when you're in Florida, <laughs> you can go check out the World Golf Hall of Fame and you can see Marilyn Smith represented there. Thank you. So well, thank we're looking you. forward to having you. Take it away, Marilyn, and Take tell us <laughs> how did you ever get into golf? I've always thought of myself as an ordinary person who has led an extraordinary life. I have been to all 50 states, 37 countries, and met six U.S. presidents, all because of golf. And I have to pinch myself. And uh, I've met Eisenhower all the way from Eisenhower to Kennedy to Trump, and uh, that was quite an experience to meet them. Now, remember, in the, in the 40s, a, a girl wasn't supposed to play golf. Uh, we were supposed to be married, have a family, and cook. And uh, I didn't want to play golf anyway. I wanted to play baseball. My my ambition was to be <coughs> excuse me be the pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals. So um, I, and when I was 10, 11, and 12 years old, I was the pitcher, the coach, and the manager of a boys' baseball team. And when I came home one day, my mother said, "Well, how'd you do today, dear?" And I picked up my mitt and I threw it against the wall and I said a, a four-letter word beginning with S that I had picked up from the boys. So she marched me into the laboratory and washed my mouth out with Life Boy soap. And when my dad came home, she told him what I had said. And he said, we better take her out to the Wichita Country Club. I was living in Wichita, Kansas, and teach her more ladylike sport. So that's how I got into golf. And uh, I thought it was it's a very humbling game, and it also teaches you patience. <laughs> so I advise you all, all to take up golf. It's a lifetime sport. It's a family sport, and you can play it till you're 110. So stay well and play golf. Well, when I went to the University of Kansas, uh, there was no golf team. But I wanted to play in the National Intercollegiate Golf Tournament. So and it was going to be played at Ohio State. So my dad asked the director of athletics, Paul Gallon, if he could get some expense money for his daughter to play in this tournament, the National Intercollegiate Golf Tournament. He said, Mr. Smith, it's too bad your daughter is not a boy. So that was the catalyst for me to create my Pro-Am, which raises money from my scholarship fund. Uh, last year we made $166,000 and we awarded $35,000 scholarships to help young women go to college. So my passion now is working on this Pro-Am to help young women go to college. We started the LPGA and there were 13 of us and we went I think the first year we had 13 tournaments. The total prize money was $50,000, and Babe Zahari was le leading money winner. She won $14,000. So look at the difference now. One tournament may be $2 million for the girls. So it's come a long way. And a lot of people say, did you ever envision the LPGA being the way it is? Of course not. 
it's just amazing how as we have such a wonderful commissioner Michael Wan now he's done a fantastic job we had a great staff and they're so dedicated into helping make the organization the top organization in the country and I'm just proud to be a member and was able to we were persistent you know uh, uh, Babe Zaharias was our marquee player and everybody would come out to see her play she was Olympic champion and when she, she was kind of quick with a quip and one time she would say well I'm gonna loosen my girdle and let it fly and people loved to watch her play because she hit the ball a long way she was our longest hitter she kind of hit the ball and kind of fall back but she was and uh, we were very we were very good friends in fact I'll have to tell you a story I was playing with her and Patty Berg in a tournament in Chicago and uh, we walked off the first tee and uh, Babe put her arm around me and she said Smitty she said I always love to play golf with you because you always get the gallery well of course I didn't get the gallery she got the gallery but she made me feel comfortable and that was nice so I always I, we were good friends uh, the early days we had some tough struggles um, we, we traveled by car sometimes long distances like 1600 miles from uh, Spokane to Waterloo um, Wiffy Smith had a motor home and she had a piano in it and she'd play the piano to keep her fingers uh, strong and she was quite quite a good player and um, we also played courses very long 6250 to 6900 yards long the Concord Hotel in New York didn't want the girls to play well so they put us way back and it rained the night before and it was, the course played like 7200 miles I mean not miles but yards long and Shirley Englehorn shot 77 76 76 I want to tell you about another famous golfer Louise Suggs we were playing uh, Shirley Spork and I were paired with Louise in, in Chicago and the wind was blowing 60 miles an hour and sure Shirley took a back swing and she she missed the ball and of course Shirley and I just started laughing you know we thought that was funny that she whiffed it uh, Louise had a 78 in that 60 mile an hour wind which is tells you what a great player she was she was the founder of the LPGA and one of our presidents when we went to these towns we, uh, you see the smaller towns couldn't afford to have the men so they would play like Waterloo Iowa and Carrollton and Santa Barbara uh, and these people welcomed us of course the men did too and we had pro-ams and and we would play with the men and it was just uh, uh, they helped us get over the hump when you know we didn't have a lot of help so we got more tournaments that way and um, uh, of course we didn't make much money but we, we played because we loved the game and uh, when babe of course passed away uh, we almost went kaput so some of us were public relations minded I, I remember going to baseball games st. Louis Cincinnati and Washington DC and hitting golf balls from home plate out to center field and then get on the mic and tell the folks to come out and watch the girls play and then uh, Shirley Spork and I went to a boxing match and we were supposed to get in the in the ring you know after well this one fellow was just pulverizing this and I can't stand the sight of blood so I couldn't get in the ring but Shirley got right in there she hopped through the ring I mean through the ropes and got up there on that ring and got the microphone and told him to come out and watch us play the US Open so we did a lot of those things to try to uh, get people to come out and watch us play um, the Sports Illustrated had two style shows for us one in um, Dallas and one in Las Vegas and they chose eight of us dressed us up in long a long, in long not a long dress but a dress and high heels and a hat and we did style shows and that way to kind of promoted the game I was the first lady pro to put putt left hand low and this was back in the 50s and uh, everybody came up and said gosh you look funny putting left hand low well in those days a girl didn't want to look funny so I quit which was the worst thing and a lot of teachers tell me now that when they're teaching young people to, to start the game they teach them left hand low and um, NB Park's got to be a fantastic putter and so is Jordan Spieth you know he's left hand low as, as well shot that fantastic 64 in the last round of the Masters I met General Eisenhower at the Cherry Hills Country Club and my uncle was governor of Kansas and made the second nominating speech for Ike and I met John Kennedy I was living in Tequesta Florida and at the time with my parents 
and the pro called up and said, well, President-elect Kennedy is going to tee off. Uh, would you like to meet him? I, I met him, and he, he looked at you with those beautiful eyes, and we just had a, a great, I still remember shaking hands with him and looking at him, how what a handsome fellow. And then he promptly, slice went off to the right. And then I met uh, George H. B. Uh, Bush, the, the older one. And then I met uh, President Trump in 2006. I was down in Palm Beach, Florida to get some kind of an award at a Women's Chamber of Commerce luncheon. I don't remember what the award was, but he was two seats from me. And we met and had a picture taken together holding a club. And I wrote back and I, I wrote him and I said, do you mind if I use this for my Christmas card? He wrote back and said, no, that's fine. So that was my Christmas card in 2006. <laughs> I was very fortunate that when I turned pro, the Spalding Sporting Goods Company hired me $5,000 a year, unlimited expense account, and a green dodge with a white line. And I threw him to I asked him to throw two mitts in so I could play catch with the caddies after golf. Well, it's called Have, Have Clubs Will Travel. And it tells about, of course, the 13 founders. It's got something about them and a picture of, it, of each one. It, it does tell you one thing that was told to me by Harry Presser. I, he taught Mickey Wright, you know, who is one of the famous all-time great golfers. And that is, I'm going to give you a tip now. This is, this is worth $100. The forefinger and thumb of the right hand and the toe of the club to the target. And no one had ever told me that. You know, you turn here, shoulder back, drop in the slot, and then the forefinger and thumb and toe of the club to the target. And when I did that, that's when I won my, in my tournaments when I, when I did that. Tell yeah, th this is the dance. hook. See, that's a hook. This is straight, because when you turn, see, you're still straight. And this is a fade off to the right. If you can dance, you can, can play golf because it's all rhythm and timing. My pro in Wichita, Kansas, Mike Murray, he would say, swing the waltz music. Da, 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 da. Pardon my singing. I might be off key. Da, 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 bum, 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 bum. <laughs> oh, let me tell you about title holders. Um, right, go for it. Uh, I want to tell you about a major tournament, the title holders, which I was fortunate to win twice. That We, went, we called it Fun Night. And we would all go to dinner in the clubhouse and meet the sponsors or the, some members. And we would do different things, like Jackie Pung would do the hula. And Babes of Harris would play the harmonica, and Betty Dodd would play the guitar. And Patty Berg and Shirley Ingle Englehorn and I would sing off key, of course, Five Foot Two Eyes of Blue. But that, that was a fun night to get us away from the golf course. We, you know, dressed up a little bit, and, and uh, it was wonderful. That's one of the, not the funnest thing, but one of the most wonderful things that I think about. I have a lovely picture of uh, Jack Nicklaus and Barbara. I played. I was fortunate to to play with uh, with Jack Nicklaus, and wonderful gentleman, and uh, very helpful. Gave me some a suggestion on putting. And my hero, one of my heroes, you know, is Ben Hogan, and I was able to play with him in a pro-am in Dallas. And we both shot 72 from the same tees, but he missed, I think, at least five putts three feet and under. Of course, he played much better than I did, but uh, he was so kind, and I enjoyed that. And then I played golf with Lee Trevino. Also Arnold Palmer, too. So playing with those fellows was, was fun. The pro-am is... Uh, we have 46 lady pros that play in, it, in the Pro-Am. One lady pro plays with four men and women amateurs. It can be four men together or a mixed group uh, in, a, in a scramble event. And it's on eight, October 1st this year here at Pebble Creek where I live. This is an active adult community. of two. We have two golf courses here, two clubhouses, a 325-seat theater, and uh, 8,000 friendly people. If you want to come to lunch, it's $30 to come to the lunch if you don't want to play in it. What's fun about it is I, I invite one of the girls who's received one of my scholarships, and uh, we, they come and, and play in the tournament, and then they speak. So people know where their money is going to. Last year we had Michelle Shams. I'd just like to thank all the girls with whom I played years ago, and we were like a family, and it, it meant a lot to me, and we're still good friends and uh, so many people. And also... Fond recollections of those smaller towns that uh, were so good to us and helped us and made us feel comfortable and, and wanted.
Marilyn, thank you so much for being on the show today and Real telling pleasure. us some really great stories and all the wonderful people you've known. What a great life. A big thank you to Marilyn Smith for sharing with us today. And you can read much more in Have Clubs Will Travel, Marilyn's book. She told us she will personally sign a copy for you. So contact us if you would like to place an order. I'm Georgia Lord, Mayor of Goodyear. And I can't tell you how delighted we are to have Marilyn Smith as a member of our community. Goodyear is a dynamic city of almost 70,000 people, but we still have that hometown feel and those traditional values that we have all grown to love. Marilyn is an extension of those values, and her remarkable contributions have made significant impact on the lives of others throughout our community. As a renowned golfer, Marilyn has paved the way for women athletes alike through her successful career, and she continues to be a mentor to others both near and far. We are honored to have been selected as the host city for her annual golf tournament. Congratulations, Marilyn, for your recognition as our hometown hero. It is well deserved. I'm here today at the home of Shirley Spork, and she's joining us to talk a little bit about her experiences as one of the founders of the LPGA, and she's also known Marilyn Smith, our hometown yeah. hero, for how right. long, Shirley? Gosh, we have known her since 1947, which is about 71 years ago, it's... and we've traveled throughout this country and some other tournaments in Europe uh, together, and uh, I guess we're just like sisters. Uh, we've done, been there, done that, and that's about it. Uh, uh, starting out, uh, I first met her at the Intercollegiate at Ohio State University in 1947. And from that time on, we were uh, associated in competition as amateurs. Uh, there was no thought of professional golf at the time. Uh, the reason we have a golf tour is because of Babe Zaharias, because she was a star in the 32 Olympics. Uh, she also desired to play the game of golf. And uh, after the Olympics, the Olympic Committee deemed her a professional because she had received money playing baseball. So she had to be uh, considered a professional, but there was nothing to compete in. So she received her uh, amateur standing back and went to Europe and won the women's British amateur. Came back to this country and could not play in any amateur tournaments, basically. There weren't many to play in. So she convinced... Uh, L, Mr. Isley of Wilson Sporting Guns to uh, st to hire a tournament director and start a tour. So from that point on, we were only really playing amateur golf as part of a segment of the women's Western amateur. And Marilyn and I were in Chicago and playing at the course where Babe was the professional. She was the head pro. <coughs> and we're having breakfast, and she said to me, she said, listen, kid, she says, we're going to have a tour, and we need numbers. I want you to turn pro. And I said, well, gosh, how do you do that? <laughs> and she got up from the table, came around, and whacked me on the head and said, I deem you a professional. You go down on that tee and you tell them you're a pro. So it was quite a, a jaunt down the hill. And should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? Something I wanted to do. So I got to the tee box and I said to Mrs. Dennehy, who was the president of the Women's Western Golf Association, excuse me, I would like you to introduce me as a pro today. And she said, does your mother know that? And I said, no, but she'll know tonight. So that's how I turned pro. Marilyn uh, turned professional uh, and decided it, and worked for Spalding. And they gave her a car, and her job was to go around the country and give exhibitions. 
to promote Spalding equipment. And uh, also, uh, we were able to, Louise Suggs was able to represent McGregor, and the Babe was representing Wilson, and Patty Berg was Wilson. And the fourth manufacturer was Golfcraft, which is Titleist today. And I was fortunate to uh, become affiliated with Golfcraft. And our job was to be, uh, the title we had is advisory staff. And today, advisory staff is a computer. In our era, it was a human being. And our job was to test the equipment and tell the manufacturer we didn't like the color, the looks of it, uh, how it hit the ball, and all those kind of things. So on the tour, after the first uh, three or four years, I brought up the subject of starting a teaching division. Well, it uh, did not pass for three years. The fourth year, it passed by one vote. Marilyn was president of the tour division at the time. So in 1959, the LPGA teaching division was started. And today, I'm so proud to to be part of an organization of 1,717 members. And we're divided in sections of this country. And just within the last two years, we've gone global and have an Asian division of the LPGA. I have a tournament myself called the Shirley Sport Masters Pro-Am. And uh, that was 10, 10 days ago, I think. Uh, and uh, this is my third year, and I honor two of our master professionals each year. Marlene Bauer, Hagee, Hovey, Loss, Vossler, uh, and Marilyn and I are the only three left. And uh, we continue to enjoy the game, share our knowledge with other uh, teachers, and uh, hope that we've been able to uh, enjoy uh, showing other people that golf can be fun. Sixth grade or seventh grade, I wrote, read in the encyclopedia about Babe Dietrichson, and I thought, if this woman can do all those things, maybe I can do one thing. And so uh, we, my family, we moved next to a golf course, and that's why I got to play the game of golf, because I found used golf balls and purchased my first club of putter for a dollar. So that's the name of my book is From Green to Tea, because I started with a putter. But my book that's just been published is 18 holes. It's not chapters, it's 18 holes. And each hole tells a story of something that's happened in my life. Marilyn loved baseball. And Babe Zaharias, Marilyn, and I went to a St. Louis Cardinal game. And Babe was sitting, eating popcorn. And she would put one on her hand and tap her hand and catch the popcorn in her mouth. And as she did that, Marilyn and I thought, well, we ought to try that, sort of. So we got popcorn all over the ground. We haven't hit our mouth. We had popcorn all over us, you know. And Babe's just laughing like crazy. Very, very special time was at Pebble Beach. We were playing a practice round for the Weather Vane tournament. And we got out to a, a hole which was parallel to Bing Crosby's home which was right on the golf course. And he was sitting on a bench smoking his pipe, and he had about four clubs. And Marilyn says, there's, there's Ben Crosby, there's Ben Crosby. I said, yeah, that's Ben Crosby, Marilyn. <laughs> and she said, oh, oh. And he said, hi, ladies. He said, can I play a few holes with you? Well, Marilyn was so excited. I mean, she just, she always was excited about anything new and, and wanted to be part of it and um, so we played I can't remember the holes but we played like four holes and came back right parallel to his house 
And uh, he said, would you like to come in and have a Coke? Well, wow, Marilyn's was going crazy. And we sent the caddies back to the clubhouse, and he said, we went in his den, and he had a Wurlitzer that was made from the floor to the ceiling, and it had shelves of records. And you press, press the button, and the thing would go up the shelf and pick up the record and bring it down and play it. He did not. He did not have one of his records there. So everyone else's records. So we were just, you know, our eyes are popping out of our head, and we had the coke. And he said, "I'll t I'll drive you back to the lodge at Pebble Beach." So we get in his car, and Joan Fontaine had given him a carriage bell that they use on the in San Francisco it goes ding dong ding dong and it's on the floor and you push it with your foot so as we're driving along he'd punch that bell and it go ding dong ding dong guess what we both had to have one of those bells in our car later on and uh, and we always remember that story uh, uh, with Bing Crosby and uh, but what we did was when we traveled together one would drive and the other would write. The minute we got in the car, we would write a letter to the lady in, in charge of the locker room, the, the uh, volunteer, the pro, sponsor, and whoever was driving, the other was writing. So we got to the next town and the next tournament, the letter was in the mail. Both of our parents taught us to thank people. And to this day, Marilyn must write 20 letters, notes a day. Shirley, I can't tell you what I've learned today, how interesting it has been. I uh -huh. know Marilyn's just going to be tickled to see that you're <laughs> here uh -huh. and that you have remembered some of the things the two of you have done together and then filling us in on uh, your feeling and experience with the LPGA. Hi, Marilyn. <laughs> Miss Personality Forever, Marilyn Smith, spelled with two ends, Marilyn Smith, two ends. Bye, Marilyn. Touring in the Valley today, <laughs> we're here at the home of Marlene Hagee Vossler, and she is one of the original 13 founders of the LPGA, and uh, she's with us today, and she knows both Shirley, and she, of course, knows Mar uh, Marilyn. They're, they were together for many years. And we uh, are going to ask her to tell us a little bit about what she knows about Marilyn and what her life was like as she was on the original tour. I remember Marilyn as being always in such a good mood and so nice to everybody. And I told her uh, not too long ago, I said, you know, Marilyn, in all the years I've known you, I just thought that it can't be real the, that you're so nice because nobody's that nice and I've come to realize that you really are that way and uh, she really uh, the glass is half full with Marilyn and uh, she she's a lovely lovely woman and uh, she has so much energy and she's done a lot now in her retirement years to help the young people golf and and it's work it's very hard work my father and my mother's family were um, immigrants from the Ukraine area and their parents and ancestors were had migrated to Russia from Germany uh, as farmers because they needed farms to be they needed farmers to for, for uh, the U Ukraine and Kiev and um, they apparently came over. My father was uh, a 17 in 1913, and uh, um, Tsar Nicholas had waged the, the, the revolution over there, and everybody knew that everybody was going to get killed. So his parents only had money to, had to pay half of the fare to pay one person, and he was the youngest. So he came over in 1913, and uh, my mother's uh, people had come over on the same boat. They didn't meet at that same time, and they just sent everybody where they need, needed them. And they ended up in a town of 800 people in Eureka, South Dakota. 
<laughs> and so uh, it took him two and a half years to work off the other half of the fare. And he was very proud of it. And he, because he felt like how you live your life and what you feel about things is what defines you as a person. And he tried to instill that in us. And so I remember when I was three and a half, he was going to start me in golf. My sister, she, she was six and a half years older than I. Mm -hmm. And she wasn't very interested in golf at all. And she had already, well, I was three and a half, so she was going on 10. And uh, the, the caddies hang, hung around there, and she was very pretty. And so she, they kind of, you know, and she was interested in other things and, you know, clothes and everything. And so, but then when the people that came to play, it was a public course. And they thought, oh, God, watch this little girl. And she was seeing how much attention I got. <laughs> so she decided to take it up to. So he sat us down one day. I was about seven. He said, now, look, this, there's 800 people in this town. Very few, especially women, have a chance to get out in the world and do anything other than get married and have six children, which is nothing wrong with that. But you, you have to do something that's going to allow you to make your own choices. And it's not about money. It's just about all money does for you is give you freedom, and that's freedom of choice. And then you have to be smart enough to make the right choices. So I've always remembered that. And it's, I couldn't have had two better parents ever. I was very fortunate. I was what you would call maybe a child prodigy. And, and there were no courses for us to play on. They kicked you off golf courses because like, and then we moved, uh, we moved to uh, Long Beach when I was, he packed up the truck because the season in Eureka, South Dakota is about three weeks if you don't have downpours and mosquitoes and stuff like that. I'm exaggerating, but it's basically true. So he uh, packed up the little Model T Ford, made a pickup out of the trunk, and uh, we took us eight days to get here. And when we got to California, there weren't any freeways, obviously. This was 1943. Uh, and uh, the first town we hit in California was um, Death Valley. <laughs> and we got out of the little car and we looked around and he says, this is what <laughs> everybody's wanting. <laughs> but so, and we ended up in Pasadena for a little while and then we grew up in Long Beach, California. And uh, so we... Uh, we all signed the document to start the LPGA, and we had to be all there to do it. So that's when I met her and Shirley, and well, I played the tour when I was 15 started, and I started playing the tour then. There wasn't much of a tour. <laughs> and so uh, I retired when I was 62, so I played the tour for 47 years. So. Wow. I was pretty vested in it. Oh, oh yes, the family traveled. In fact, I uh, went. I started high school. Um, they had three levels then, and high school started in the tenth grade. And I was about a couple months in the tenth grade when I turned pro, and um, I started the LPJ. So I was fifteen. So my father went to the. Uh, principal there. It was uh, 2,500 children that went to uh, high school there in Culver City it was and uh, asked for permission. He said you got my blessing. He said she, you know what she wants to do. She's going to be well taken care of with her parents traveling, traveling with her parents. He said she can only get in trouble here and he's so right. 80% of golf is mental after you have a way to swing. I was one of the golfers that either drew the ball from right to left, you know. And so every time that there were some pins on the left-hand side, they said, oh, you were the one that put the pins there, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. My father, he enjoyed teaching, and he, uh, he died very young. He was 61. 
And I vowed at the time that um, he died in the winter of six of uh, 1957, I think it was, six or seven. And um, the tour was going to start in a couple of months or so, and I said, I'm going to win the next tournament for my dad. And my mother and Alice looked at me and said, okay, you know, <laughs> that's just a pipe dream. So I remember on the 18th hole, it was in Sebring, Florida, the first tournament. And I had a putt on the back fringe. It was downhill and, you know, kind of rolling. And I just wanted to two-putt. If I two-putted, I was in the playoff. If I sunk it, I won, which was, you know, a pipe dream. And I sunk it. <laughs> and Hanson, Beverly Hanson, looked at me and she said, I can't even get mad. She said, I haven't seen anything like that. And I said, well, I was kind of on a mission. I don't know if that helped. But no, I'm in the LPGA Golf Hall of Fame and the World Golf Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Marilyn, I love you dearly. And you keep hanging in there because you're doing a world of good for, for the girls coming up. We've enjoyed meeting Shirley and Marlene and putting together a total picture of the original founders that are here with us today to discuss all the memories, and it's been enjoyable. And Marilyn, we're thinking about you over here in Coachella Valley. Marilyn, I love you, and I still wish you'd get a dog because I know you miss Benny. Well, thank you for being with us on Hometowns and Heroes. I hope you enjoyed the show just as much as we enjoyed putting it together for you. And if you have a hero in your hometown, please let us know about him or them, and we'll see what we can do. Until then, let's make this world a better place. Join us again next time to hear another inspiring story featuring our next hometown hero. If you have a hero in your hometown, let us give them a hand. Hey!